Hello, everybody, and welcome to another Cyber Lounge webinar. I'm joined this time by uh, with uh, Dana Mantilia, um, who's the founder of IPP. Dana, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Hello there. Thank you for having me. My name is Dana Mantilia, and I am the founder of Identity Protection Planning. Okay, and uh, Dana's got a webinar, and I think we're just going to go right over to it. Um, okay. So yeah, um, without further ado, pretty much we can see there are already some people in, in the uh, uh, watching live. So yeah, I think we'll just get right on it. Okay, All right. Dana. Good, good stuff. So today we are going to talk about data exposure and identity theft and how it is affecting everybody. Let's see if I can get my screen to work here. Oh, yep, yeah, there we go. So there's three different ways that we are becoming uh, exposing our data we're exposing it ourselves with what we're you know we share with other people and share online trickery some people are tricking us into um, sharing our information and then data breaches which is out of our control so how are we sharing our information so well just take a look at the back of this car when we look at all the stickers we like to put on our car about all the things that we do and things that we love and you know what does it what does it say about us you know maybe it says oh i'm married to somebody who you know works far away and isn't home all the time or we ride motorcycles so we have fancy things in our garage that you might want to steal and we also share information when we're posting on social media you know everything going on with our kids where we're going on vacation big career um promotions and stuff like that and one thing i'm always talking about are the facebook quizzes stop taking facebook quizzes have you ever noticed that the facebook quizzes the questions are very similar to some of your security questions that you have on your online banking or some of your online accounts and i i made a video about this and then i interviewed one of my bad hackers turned good and he verified for me that some of these quizzes are actually made by identity thieves i know that sounds crazy but they are and it makes sense right because if you can get the information the security questions some of this stuff so don't take the Facebook quizzes. All right, how are we being tricked into sharing our data? Well, sometimes people call and they are very stern and they pretend that they're calling from the government and that they're demanding information. Sometimes it's someone that we know and trust and unfortunately they have malicious intentions. Online quote unquote friends. There's a lot of online communication, a lot of online connections and everything. So there's going to be relationships that are going to develop, which makes sense. But we have to be very careful with some of those because some are some are, are good people. Some have ill intentions and they will create this false relationship that you feel that you're having. And then they may have to borrow some money. So they'll say, hey, can I borrow some money? I promise I'm going to pay you back. And of course, you're thinking this is your new best friend. Sure, of course, it's not a problem. So you let them borrow money and then they disappear and take your money. So now you're heartbroken and you're out, out the cash. So online relationships are great, but just be very careful with information that you're sharing with these people, as well as it, if they ask for money, you gotta be very careful about that. And then other ways that we share our data, somebody sends an email asking us to log into our account and update information. And we think that it's a legitimate email, so we do. Now, one thing that's out of our control are these data breaches. And data breaches are happening all the time. They happen so much that we, we're we not even really affected by them anymore. We're like, oh, another data breach, not a big deal. Every time there is a data breach, we should all be saying, oh my goodness, there's another big data breach with lots of personal information that was exposed. And it's out there. And once it's out there, it's hard to get it back into. It's like putting the genie back in the bottle. It's very, very hard. So when we have these data breaches, we have to be, be aware of them. And we have to know that Every time that they they are going out there, they're exposing ton of ton of information. And you know, let's say you have a little tiny data breach. Let's take Grubhub. It's a food delivery service. So you think, well, okay, they had a data breach, and a phone number. I'm sorry, email and a password were taken. So you think, well, what's what's the big deal? It's not that big of a deal. It's just the food delivery. Just my email. Not a big deal. But the problem is, is that a lot of people use the same email and the same password for logins for a lot of their different accounts. So this little Grubhub data breach exposed this information that maybe that exact same information can get someone into your banking account, your social media accounts. So because the data breaches, we can't control that. But what we can control is having different passwords for different uh, accounts. So that way, like example, the Grubhub one, now they can get into your Grubhub account, but they wouldn't be able to get into your banking account. So just food for thought, different passwords for different accounts. 
So identity theft has been going on for a very long time, except technology has exponentially increased the chances of us becoming victims of identity theft. So let's just take a little walk down the technology road. So in 1921, there was a boxing match between Dempsey and Carpentier. And this is the very first event that more people were, at, were able to listen to and, and be at the event at the same time than the people that were physically there. So this is a really big deal. The first time ever there were people, more people were able to participate in an event than the people that were actually there. And if we think about that, 1921, yes, it was it was a long hundred years ago, but it's it's not that long ago. And to think that that's the first time that that ever happened, that that's kind of crazy. Then we get to 1960, so now we're talking about TV, and there, the way that uh, it affects us differently with our perceptions. So, the Nixon and Kennedy debate. People that watched it on TV, well, people that listened to it on the radio, they thought that Nixon won, and then the people that watched it on TV, they thought that Kennedy won. They said that you know Kennedy was much better looking and he looked more confident and Nixon was sweating, so maybe he was nervous. So it's amazing that just by adding that extra sense of being able to watch the, the debate versus just listening to it, how it changed the way people uh, viewed the actual outcome of the debate. And then 2007, everybody's favorite time, the iPhone, right? Steve Jobs announced the smartphone. This is where everything starts to really change here social media explosion. Social media really is not that old when you think about it. So smartphones, social media, and these social media platforms, there's a lot of psychology that goes behind that. We're going to talk about that in a minute. We have to know that these social media companies are tracking every click, every scroll, every pause, every like, every comment, every single thing that we are doing while we're on these social media platforms. They are tracking. And they take that information and they put it together with artificial intelligence. And we're going to watch in the next video about Sean Parker explaining that the platform was built for addiction. So let's take a little look here. All right. You might need to turn up your volume or you might not. Let's see. So this is Sean Parker, the Facebook's first president, and a little something to say here. We need to sort of give you a little dopamine hit every once in a while um, because someone liked or commented on a photo or a post or whatever. It's a social validation feedback loop. It's exactly the kind of thing that a, that a hacker like myself would come up with because you're exploiting a vulnerability in in human psychology. And I just I, th I think that we you know we, the inventors creators you know and it's, it's me it's mark it's the you know kevin sister at instagram it's all of these people um understood this consciously and we did it anyway it's unbelievable actually the silicon valley executives there's a school called the waldorf school out in silicon valley and they don't allow any technology in the school it's all paper and pencil and 75 percent of the students enrolled in that school are the sons and daughters of silicon valley tech execs so they know a lot that we don't know. And that's a very good question. You know, unregulated, like any other product or service um, that, that we know is affecting people, what are we going to do about it? Yep. So here goes into a little bit of the psychology of what he was just talking about. So there's a professor, Robert Sapolsky. And this whole premise of social media and what, what um, Sean Parker was just talking about is based on the gambler effect. So when you're when you're pulling a slot machine and you pull the slot machine and you're waiting waiting to see what's going to happen if you're going to win you're going to win a lot you're going to win a little you're not going to win anything <clears throat> that creates the excitement if every single time you pulled the slot machine you won yeah okay great I won again you know it wouldn't really be that great but this gambler mentality and when they pull that slot slot lever and you're waiting to see what's going to happen what's going to happen what's going to happen that they say creates the same kind of dopamine kick as if somebody who's doing cocaine which is kind of crazy when you think about that and that's what the whole thing with social media they want to keep you on that platform and you want to wait for likes and comments and see things and and then you get a notification that somebody you know commented on your post so you're back on the on the platform and that's what their goal is all right so how is all of this working here so i talk about this a lot the listening these devices are listening, right? We have GPS locations. They're tracking where we are. They're listening with the microphones. They're watching us through the cameras, all these devices. And they tell the companies where to go, where they tell where we go, what we buy, who we're meeting, 
and they monitor our steps and much, much more. So, and we always have our phone on us, right? We wouldn't go somewhere without your phone. So it's a perfect opportunity to track everything you're doing. And then the companies train the algorithms to exploit our weaknesses, to bring profits, sell that information to the marketing companies. And then the algorithm learns the data behavioral residue allows the platform to study our strengths and our weaknesses and continue to feed that whole thing. And we have to remember when something says it's free, is it really free? Well, on social media platforms where everything is free, quote unquote, we are paying with our data. That's how we are paying for use for all these lovely, fun platforms. So what happens? They gain our attention. They take all this information, turn it into data, and then they sell it to the marketing companies and make lots and lots of money. So here's one thing I thought this was very startling. So in 2014, so this is a few years ago, 2014, Facebook stated that with 150 likes that you like on your account, they know you better than your family. And with 300 likes, they know you better than your spouse. So that's kind of crazy. Back in 2010, the Google, 2010, right? Okay, 2010, the Google CEO says, we don't need you to type anymore because we know people that well. So that's, that's crazy. Again, when they track everything that you do, they do know everything about you, right? And then Apple uses the data to control its app store and resulting in $8 billion last year. So this is what the dinner table looks like now. Everybody's together at the, the dinner table, but everyone's in their own little world on their phones. So here's a little video to watch. Might need to turn the volume up on this one. I'm not hungry. What's wrong, sweetheart? I miss daddy. I know. We all miss him. I miss him more. I miss him the most. I miss him so much. Hey, hey, everyone shut up. This, this filter makes me look like a cat. This is so funny. It's making me cry. <laughs> so with that, I, I talk about device-free dinners. Now, lots of families are used to everyone sitting down with their device. So to say, well, we're going to have at least one meal a week without the devices, this may be, be a little challenging, but I think it should be a goal for everybody to say, you know, one meal a week, we are going to have device free if you are a device family at the table. The problem with that is you need to prepare for it because if everyone is used to just sitting down at their, at, at their plate, on their phone, in their own little world, and then you take those devices away and no one's planned for, well, what are we going to talk about? Everyone is going to sit there looking at each other and it's going to get awkward and no one's going to, no one's going to want to feel comfortable. No one's going to feel comfortable. So no one's going to want to keep doing this. So we need to find a couple of topics, something fun to talk about, something just anticipate, so you anticipate that this, this silence is going to be there so that it doesn't just stop and everyone's, you know, sitting there like that. So that's a good goal for everybody to put the phones down at least so we can have conversation and start getting away from have everybody in our world that's at the table instead of us being in our own little world. All right. Now, this is one thing I talk about, and I think this also is why we fall for a lot of online scams, because for whatever reason, and this video is, is kind of cute the way that it explains it, but we think very differently when we're dealing with people face to face than when we are dealing with them online. So let's take a quick look at this video here. Social networking is completely out of control these days. But do the things we do online make sense in real life? Let's take to the streets and find out. Ma'am? Hi. I just want to let you know that I'm following you. Like, just giving you an alert. Okay. You don't have to do anything. Just know it and enjoy it. Jenna Kingsley is now following you. Just, like, do whatever and I'll just watch. Is that creepy? You want to poke me back? Was that fun? Yeah, it's just weird that I don't even know you. I know, but that's what you do, right? Hi, guys. I was wondering if you would, like, accept my friendship request. Friendship what? You looked really important with, like, the whole button down. Do you want to be connected? Do you want to be connected? How do, I, how do you want to be connected? I just want to let you know that 12 people have viewed you. 12 people have viewed you on the subway. What does that mean? I don't know. He must be really important. They're like viewing you. 
that guy chose to remain anonymous. Mm -hmm. Seven people have viewed you on the subway. I have just checked into Grand Central Station. What's your name? Jenna and Andrew have just checked into Grand Central Station with about uh, 452 other people. That's so cute. I have to share this with everybody. Do you want to comment on how cute this is? This is cute. I like your comment. Excuse me, sir. Can you introduce me to that guy that's living next to you? This guy? You're like our one degree connection. Okay. So, if you could introduce me. All right. And your name is? Jenna. Excuse me? Hey, uh, my, uh, my friend over here, uh, Jenna, she'd like me to, uh, introduce you to her. So. Hey. I'm Jenna. I mean, we had him in common, so I figured I should meet you. And now we're all connected. So that I think is a good video too to show the kids because they could they just connect with everybody and you know you, you say to a, a kid how many <laughs> friends do you have in your social media circles and they say you know 3000 how can they have 3000 how can these kids know 3000 people is it because do they really know these people so I think that that's a good video to share, share with the kids and speaking of the kids uh here we go so this is another thing that's the negative of uh, online and these kids being connected 24 seven. And it's a lot easier to be behind a screen and to say something mean and nasty to somebody than it is to actually go up to their face and say it. And, but it's just as, just as hurtful. So that's something that we really need to start having these conversations with kids and letting them know that everybody at some point in their life, everybody is bullied. And to anticipate what that feeling is going to be, it's going to be a terrible feeling. It, it's going to be the hot rush through your body. And you're going to say, oh, my goodness, I can't believe this. You know, and you feel awful. So you could have put a post up there and have 20 people that liked it or made nice comments. And then one person makes a nasty comment. And that overrides the whole entire thing and just completely, you know, squashes the way these poor kids uh, are feeling about themselves. 20, yeah, 24 7 communication and bullying is an all time high. It's very, very, very serious. And we need to somehow start conversations with these kids. <clears throat> this is a great movie. It's, hopefully most of you have seen it. It's called Social Dilemma. And it talks about that addictive psychology behind uh, the phones and the social media platforms and all that kind of stuff. And I highly recommend that you that you take a look at it. So after I watched it, I reached out to the producers and they, I said, I, I, I wanna help. I wanna help somehow spread this message here. You know, what can I do? So they directed me to this website, Digital Future Initiatives, and there's a course you can go through and at the Parent Academy, and then you get certified, and then they give you this presentation that you can show if you're a teacher, even just to your own family, to, to anybody. I think we should all be showing it to everyone, and it's very, very helpful. A lot of the information in this presentation was was from that presentation. So anyway, if you get a chance, this is the uh, the website to take a look at. It's it's a great resource, great, great, great. There's little videos, there's articles. And, you know, conversation starters, how to talk to your kids about about the different things that they may be going through. And so if you get a minute, you should check it out. So these poor kids drowning, drowning, drowning. So this is when we have to ask ourselves nowadays, who has a smartphone? Pretty much everybody has a smartphone. It's more people have a smartphone than don't have a smartphone. It's very odd you find someone that doesn't have a smartphone. And if we look at this whole new using these smartphones, using these social media platforms, who trained us to use these things? Nobody trained us. Half the time now, the adults, when you have a question, you go up to your kids and you're like, hey, how do I fix this? Or what do I do with this thing? And then we have to say, when we were kids and we learned how to swim, someone didn't just throw you in the pool. They gave you lessons. But there's no lessons with any way of handling the, the addiction to the devices what they should be posting and shouldn't be posting. There should be like a, like a, like a cyber school. I can help people with that with my new podcast. But anyway, where people are learning about what they should and shouldn't be posting online, with the, about the bullying that's going on, and just about social media in general and getting away from the devices once in a while. So then you say, well, who has Instagram, Snapchat, and Facebook or some other social media? Most people have at least one social media app that they are they're using. So everybody has a phone. Everybody's on the, this is affecting everybody nowadays. So this is a video too, that talks about, um, self-esteem 
and it brings a tear to my eye every time I watch it. This one you may need to turn up the volume on your your thing. Hold on. Okay, here we go. <laughs> Dumb, ugly, and awkward or something like that. Depressing, um, a bit lonely, and not the best looking. We asked you good last nights about you. Okay. Oh boy. Um, he's, he's very considerate. He's compassionate for other people. She's extremely talented. She's really good at making people feel better. Gentle, and she has an amazing personality. But she's such a sweet, kind person. And he's really good at sharing ideas. One to quickly make jokes, and it does lighten up the day. She's just so kind. I think we need more people like her who are excited and out there and willing to put themselves in the line. She's so nice. <laughs> this is a bit of life changing. <laughs> it was really unfeeling. <laughs> I think. Hmm. So here's these three beautiful kids that have very, very low self esteem, and then they hear a few nice, positive things and you know realize that the world doesn't see them the way that they think that the world sees them so this bullying and self-esteem is something that you know I, I know i just said it 12 times before but we really need to start these conversations and it's not an easy conversation to have right out of right out of the gate you know and maybe you talk about it a little bit and then you know you, you let it go because kids may be, oh i don't want to talk about this i don't want to talk about this they may be like that they probably will be like that but then if you bring it up again then you can talk about it a little bit more and just just let them know that they are loved and beautiful and uh, can talk to you, most importantly. Okay, now on the other end of the spectrum, we have the seniors. This is the seniors, a huge, huge target for identity theft and scams, huge. So there was $3 billion reported in losses, and this is reported. And a lot of the seniors don't report things that are th that happen to them because they're afraid that their adult children are not going to let them handle their finances or you know live on their own or whatever so they don't report it and um you know i talk about the, the grandparent scam which is a big one that somebody calls up and they pretend that they're a grandchild and that they're in a mexican prison somewhere because they're on spring break and they have they have to get money wired to them right now and it, the poor grandparent is like, what's happening here? You know, they're playing off of the whole urgency. It's got to happen right now. And the whole emotion. This is their poor grandson, granddaughter that they need to help right now. So when you, whenever we're dealing with things that we're thinking at urgency and emotion, we're not thinking rationally. So and that's exactly why that scam works so well. So lots of these people are off to the bank to go wire off the money. Now, a lot of bank tellers have been kind of you know, told about this, where they may question somebody who comes down who doesn't normally wire $5,000 somewhere, and they will maybe say, what's going on with this? But that's a very sensitive conversation, too, because, you know, it might be the bank teller's business to be asking somebody what they're doing. But so if you do have older friends, parents, anybody, make sure you just mention to them that if they ever get this crazy phone call that someone is pretending that they are their grandchild, that they this is not this is probably a scam 99.9% .9 of the time it's going to be a scam and if it does happen then they need to get off of the phone and get, and call their son daughter whatever ask where junior is and find out that he is somewhere safe and secure so that's something just to to think about with the grandparent scam so why why are they falling victim well they're very trusting they're very polite they also are the ones that have financial savings so they're a good target because they have money and like I mentioned before, they're less likely to report the fraud because they don't want to lose control of their life. This is one thing for, for that's a good thing for seniors, but this is also a very good thing for all of us to do. So this has to do with our important documents that have our personal identifying information on them or any important documents related to our financing, our mortgage, our house, the deed to the deed to the house, all, all that kind of stuff. Where is it, right? So advise them to gather up all this information and advise us to gather up all this information so you know where it is 
And then also because now we have a lot of online accounts. So in addition to gathering the paper documents, we want to, in this pile, make a list of the online accounts that we have and how someone can gain access to them. So if it's an online account for a bank, this is where you, know, where you can find the login information. So everything is gonna be there. And then we need to make sure that somebody else knows about this. Uh, this is, this is a, a, I got a, at the beginning of Corona pandemic, I got a message from somebody who was a CISO over in London, and he wanted me to do a video about making sure that people share how, with someone else, how to get into their devices, their computer, because what happened is when, when the, the beginning of the pandemic was happening, people were getting whisked away to the hospital and then unfortunately passing away. Nobody was thinking before that person left for the hospital, make sure we can get into their devices, make sure we know what, what you know, where their accounts are or anything like this is. So people were reaching out to him and asking him how to break into some of these devices. And that's not, that's not the position you want to be in when somebody passes on. So the more organized we are beforehand, the better off we are. So we want to make sure we have everything nice and neat and organized. We have all the login information and what accounts actually exist together. And then we want to put them somewhere, either in a fireproof um, filing cabinet or a fire resistant document bag that you could just grab and go, keep somewhere secure and know that you can just grab and go if there's an emergency. And you look at California, these fires, these people have to get out of these houses very, very quickly. So if you had all this stuff together and you could just grab it and go, you know, then you know you're going to have your stuff with you afterwards. Um, and then here's another little thing. This is a good thing for everybody to do is to take everything out of your wallet and put it on a photocopier and copy both sides. So you have your driver's license, your credit cards, your gym membership, whatever, whatever the case may be. And then take that and put that somewhere secure, maybe with the important documents. And if you ever lose your wallet, you will know what was in it. You'll know what, what's the phone number of the credit card company that I have to call to cancel? What's my driver's license number? What was this? Which credit cards were even in, in my wallet? So it's just a quick little thing. Just dump it right out there in the photocopier. It doesn't even have to be neat. Just flip it over, take two copies, and then psh, you'll be very happy if you ever get that panic feeling, oh, goodness, I lost my wallet or my wallet was stolen. What was in it? Phone scams. So now, obviously, along with the phones, phone scams, so you can put your cell phone number on the do not call list. It doesn't really do too much, but it does stop some stuff. There's a, a new, um, the robocalls, there's a lot, lot of different ones that can stop the robocalls. This is one that, that I like, and I do think it works very, very well, and it's won a bunch of awards, that you can do this for your home line or for your cell phone. So for your home line, if you go to nomorobo.com, you can find out who your carrier is at home for your landline, and they'll tell you how to um, get that program on there. And then if you want to use it for your smartphone, you go to the app store and just download the Nomo Robo and voila, 99% of the uh, robo calls that come in, no more car warranties, all those people that are calling all the time, it'll stop. So that's nice. Uh, one thing we want to do with charities is we want to verify, is this a legitimate charity? Lots of people get phone calls about donations from um, for charities and Maybe they do know, maybe they don't know, who knows whether or not it's a legitimate charity. So when that happens, again, you want to get off the phone, you want to do a little research, and then you want to be the one that's going to call back the, the charity and give a donation. There's no reason at all why you would have to make that donation right then and there on the phone. And if they say, well, you know, whoever, um, whatever we get today, someone's going to match it or something crazy like that, then just say, well, I'm, I'm sorry, I have to do a little bit of investigating. So a good resource is charitynavigator.org. It lists all of the, not all, most of 99% of the charities that are out there that are legitimate. And it also tells you how much of your donation goes to the actual cause, which I think that's great because, you know, a lot of these times there's a lot of fat and extra expenses that get taken out. So you have the best of intentions with giving some money for a cause, but not a lot of money is getting down to the cause. So that's a nice thing to see. So charitynavigator.org. <clears throat> we mentioned before the urgency. If we really ask ourselves, you know, when when somebody calls or somebody sends you an email, this has to happen right now, right now. You know, when we ask ourselves, how many times in life do we really have to do things right now? You know, I mean, except maybe a car accident or something crazy like that. It's not a lot. But again, the scammers know that when they're either playing off of urgency or emotion, you're not thinking rationally. So if you do get an email that says you need to log in right now, something's going to expire or somebody calls you on the phone and says you need to do this right now, you have to stop for a minute and say, 
but why does this have to happen right now, right? Again, this is probably a scam. Um, hang up on pre-recorded calls, obviously. Uh, don't believe the caller ID. This is a very important thing because sometimes scammers will change the caller ID and spoof it so that it says, let's say, for example, the IRS is calling, Internal Revenue Service is calling, and now they're talking to you about you know, something with your social security number that they need to get all this information from you. And you're looking down at the phone number and they're like, well, it says it's coming in from the IRS. I better, I better cooperate. The government, the United States government is never going to call you. They are going to send you a good old fashioned letter in the mail if they ever need to get in touch with you. So that's a very good thing to know. And that's a good thing to share with your family members so that they know that if they get a phone call or an email from a government official, that is not a legitimate phone call. Uh, extended car warranties, free trial offers. That's another thing to be careful of because sometimes these quote unquote free trial offers have a little hook in there at the end and you wind up paying for it. You don't even really realize what you're signing up for. So be careful with that. International lottery. Now this is very interesting. If you ever get notified that you won the Nigerian lottery, this is fantastic, right? Woo, yay. You have to ask yourself, did you ever participate in the international lottery in order for you to to win? Like they say here, you gotta you gotta play, you gotta you gotta play to win or something like that. So if you didn't participate in an international lottery, chances are you probably didn't win. And then the grandparent scam that I just mentioned about Junior calling from Mexican prison saying you need to wire money right now to get me out. Online scams. So the romance scams, that has to do with some of our quote unquote friends that we're making online. Again, be very cautious with these things because these scammers, they will create these relationships with tons and tons of people at the same time. They'll call, instead of using your name, they call, they'll call you honey or sweetie or something like that. They try to create a, a very, very quick relationship. They're telling you that they love you a lot earlier than probably would be normal. Um, and they're playing it up that they're just this, this fantastic, fantastic person. And they're very vague with what they're saying so that they can say the same thing to all these different people. So it's, it's, it's terrible, but it's happening out there. <clears throat> the phishing emails that are going on now. These emails look good. It used to be back in the day, right? The African prince is sending you a, a, text, a text message, misspellings all over the place, but that's not what they look like now. So now they look like they're from Amazon or from FedEx. And with a lot of online shopping that we're all doing these days, you may think, oh, I have an Amazon order in. Let me click through and see what's going on with it. Don't do that. Make sure that you don't click through the email, that you go to your Amazon account separately or your FedEx account to track the package and see, you know, at that point, what's going on with the package. But don't click through these emails. Um, the tech support scam. So this is when your computer the screen is dark and it says you need to call tech tech support. They give you this phone number. So you call the phone number and then someone tells you they have to log into your computer system so that they can fix things. That is a scam. That is absolutely 100% a scam. They want to get in, in there so that then they can go smelling around inside your computer system, possibly getting into some of your online accounts. So if that ever happens, don't call the number, just turn the computer off. And then when you turn the computer back on, typically it will go away. And if it doesn't go away, then you should take it to a computer expert who can fix it. But don't call the phone number. And again, share that with everyone in your house, share that with your friends and your family so that they know, don't call the phone number. And if you do believe or anyone believes that they have been a victim, they should contact the FBI at the FBI.gov here in the US. The mailbox. So everyone thinks oh, the mailbox is not that big of a deal. We really need to make sure we're emptying the mailbox as close to the time that the mailman is delivering the mail because there's a lot of good stuff in that mailbox and there's credit card offers your some of your bank statements might be in there and we want to get that out of the mailbox as soon as we can so here also you can if you don't want to receive pre-approved credit card offers you can go to um, optoutprescreen.com and you won't receive any of them and then if you decide down the road, you do want to maybe get a new credit card and you want to receive some pre-approved offers, you can go back onto the website and you can select that, yes, you'd like to receive them. So that way, when you don't want them, they're not coming because those are a little hot ticket there for identity thieves. And here in the US, we also have informed delivery. So what that does is every morning before the mail goes out, they take pictures of all the mail and they, they'll send it to you. And then when your mail comes in at night, you can compare, just quickly glance. This is what was in the pictures. This is what was actually in the mail. And if anything is missing, you're going to know. 
reviewing your explanation of benefits. So when you get medical services, I don't know, about a month later, you get a letter in the mail that says explanation of benefits, basically stating what you had done with who. And most people, I think, just throw those away. So I think we need to make sure we open them up, at least glance around at them and say, okay, yes, that's my doctor. Yes, those are the services that I had. And then shred it and get rid of it. But just take a look, because if you open it up and it says, you know, knee surgery or somebody had a baby and you're thinking, well, nobody around here, nobody in my family had a baby or knee surgery, then you know you're a victim of medical um, insurance fraud. So you need to hop on that. And that's it. So thank you very much for your time. And I hope you enjoyed this presentation and learned a few things and help spread the word to your friends and family members about all of the little scams that are going on out there. And if you want to get in touch with me, you can, I'm always on LinkedIn. So you can message me on LinkedIn or send a connection request or follow me on LinkedIn. And um, again, I guess that's it. I have my podcast coming out too. So I'll announce that on LinkedIn too. So that's it. Oscar, are you there? Are you I am. <laughs> <laughs> I am here. <laughs> Don't worry about that. Uh, yeah, that was a great, great uh, talk there, Thank Dana. Uh, we do have some questions here in the chat. Um, there is a question here, but it, it's, I suppose it's two questions um, kind of linked. Um, so why do online payment methods like Google Pay ask for our current location? There are many apps which ask for location access, which is not required. But unless we don't give location access, the app doesn't work. Um, and then what other alternatives do we have for that? That's an excellent question. So the problem is, is that there really is no other alternative in that situation. And even though you're saying, well, why do you need my location to, for me to pay this? It doesn't make any sense. It's because they're gathering that information and then they're selling that information to other marketing companies. Uh, so there really is not a, a way around that, but that's what they're doing with this. So sometimes, you know, when you, when you sign up for an app and it'll say, they, uh, this app would like access to your contacts, your, your, everything, your photos, your microphone. Sometimes you can say no and it will still let you get the app and sometimes it won't. So I tell people, you know, before we put all these apps on our phone, we should say, do we really need this? Do, you know, is, are the risks outweighing the benefits of this? And one thing too I want to mention about some of these apps is uh, there is a software called Alfonso, which is in a lot of these apps. And what it does is it listens to the TV. Even if the phone is in your pocket, it will listen to the TV for commercials and it'll track that information and send it back to um, you know the companies and then they go selling it to marketing companies. So I wish I had a better answer for you, but just be aware that, that that's what they're doing with the information. It's interesting you say that, that they're actually listening to you. It's really 1984 stuff. Um, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, so would you say that the uh, phones are kind of the biggest danger to the personal um, cybersecurity, I suppose, in the modern day? Yeah, I, I guess now, because now everybody has a phone. I mean, it used to be the family computer. Think about that. Even just uh, just a few years ago, mm. in the household, you'd have one computer that maybe, you know, the, the, the parents would use, the kids would do their papers on, you know, that kind of thing. And then it, then it turned into everybody having their own computer. And then it turned into now everybody having their own their own phone. So they used to just be able to maybe see what was going on in a household. Well, now they can see exactly everybody in that household because we do have the phones. Yeah. Um... Yeah, it's crazy how things are going like that. Um, so why is it so important for, for everybody to, to know about um, all these threats that seem to be just all, all around them at any moment? Well, there, you know, there's a lot of stuff that we can't avoid, but there is a lot of stuff that we can be proactive with. You know, it, by, by not oversharing information, by trying to keep our digital footprint as small as we possibly can, with not oversharing information, not having too many apps, not ex exposing things that you don't need to necessarily share with other people. So I think that that is probably um, one of the issues that we have nowadays is just the, the oversharing. Yeah, um, it's interesting. You were talking about all, obviously the grandparents scam. Um, now, as, as the world gets more, um, you know, more, I don't know, techno technologically advanced yeah. um, and as people get older, do you think those types of scams will work still or um, is it just because older people are just generally more trusting? Well, older people are generally more trusting and actually as we get older, our brain changes a little bit and the part of our brain that is, you know, detecting scams or a little bit questioning, it, it kind of, th those senses dissipate a little bit so that they just generally are overall, you know, more more trusting and more kind. Um, so that's, that's one thing that, that you can't really 
they're, they're, we're all, when we get older, we're all going to be the same thing because the human brain is going to st- continue to do the, to continue to do that. I think the issue now is that you have kids that have no, they know nothing except smartphones and 24 seven connections. The parents of those kids that did not grow up with it, but have had it for, you know, the past 10 years. And then some of the seniors that they have never had any of this stuff. So they, they, they just, they just don't even think this stuff is ever going to happen. So do you think because um, the kids are obviously growing up with all of these things around them, do you think that's making them take cybersecurity more seriously or less seriously because it's just so normal to them? Uh, I would say less seriously. And when it comes to kids with connecting with everybody online, they connect with people that they don't even, they say that they know these people, but they don't know these people. They'll say, oh, it's so, it's, it's like in that video when the girl's getting at the shoe shine and she's like, well, you're connected to them. So I figure I should be connected with them. And that's what happens. And some people, some of the kids, they want to get you know their follower count up really, really high. So they'll let anybody follow them. And then the problem with that is that some creepy guy gets in there and you know the location tracking that they can see with all this stuff. I mean, Snapchat maps is the perfect place for a, for a, a, um, a child predator to be because it literally will pinpoint the location down to if it was in a stadium, the exact seat that the kid is sitting in. So mm-hmm. you keep tracking these people all the time. You know, if you're in the same friend group and everyone has, has uh, um, location tracking on, they know exactly who they're with and they'll know when they're alone. So that's, that's a little nerve wracking. Yeah. Um, yeah, I suppose that is. Yeah. Cause obviously, like you say, they, they just add any, do you think there's some way for them to take it more seriously then to, to for them to realize? Cause you know, obviously I've, I've uh, received, you know, these site trainings, you don't trust strangers online. Um, and a lot of the time it doesn't really work that well. Um, like people just accept them anyway. They're just like, okay, whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, do you think there's a, better way maybe to make them truly understand um, what they're doing. I think that's one of the biggest challenges that we're facing, not only with children, but even with adults, with learning how to, you know, it's almost like we need to have public service announcements like we used to back in the day where, you know, mm-hmm. there's there's things on TV or things that, sh- that show up, you know, on your news feed that say, you know, be, watch out for this and watch out for that. Because the more we need to start talking about this stuff in a language that people understand, that's the other issue with cybersecurity is that it's usually the IT department is putting something together for the employees to suffer through for two hours once a year. And they want to like poke their eyes out by the end of it because it gets too technical. They can't understand it. And it's so boring that they, they're not paying attention. All they're saying is, when is this going to be over? And this whole shift needs to be a cultural shift with the way that we behave and the way that we think from the parents and the kids and the employees when they're at work. So that if you're continually thinking about I need to be on alert, looking out for this. Not to scare everybody. This is just a new, a new reality of, of what we need to deal with. I mean, before, before the internet, you only had to really worry about the people that were in front of you that, that you know, you were exposed to. Now it's everybody's exposed to everybody online. You know, however big your connections are. So that's one thing I think we need to to work on. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, is it a good idea to store your documents or info in the cloud as opposed to on your computer? Uh, well, I guess that depends on the level of security within the cloud. I know everybody put, we put everything on the cloud, you know, and if we actually think about it, what is the cloud? It's just another computer somewhere else. Um, that's, it, it's, it's a reality that we have to deal with. I just think you need to make sure that it's, it's in a secure location. And if it is stored on your laptop, everybody anyway should have a uh, login for your, for your laptop. So if you ever did lose it, somebody, you know, can't get it. If you put any kind of encryption onto your laptop so that if you ever lose your device it's encrypted and then if you can have a data clear or whatever on your device so if it was ever gone you from Mm -hmm. a remote location would be able to take everything off of it yeah and obviously with the passwords and everything just having one password especially um just uh yeah yeah, obviously can they you know hackers they can go on i know we've we've had conversations with lots of ethical hackers in the past and they've been um saying how they just it takes them like what five minutes to just go on facebook and see oh like it's someone's dog name Mm -hmm. of the dog five and uh they're in their account and they you know and a lot of the time obviously people don't change the passwords uh, they just use the same one so yeah um and that can obviously can that that leads to data breaches and everything yeah Mm -hmm. yeah Um, and you think of like your google account so let's say you got gmail i don't know 10 years ago and you set it up same password 
people don't understand that it's not just your Gmail that people can get access to. If someone can get into your Google account, which we're always logged into our Google account, because Google doesn't like when we're not logged in. So if you're at work and you're on your desktop, you are definitely logged into your Google account because you get big messages up at the top. It's like, alert, you're not logged in. So we have to think about this. If somebody can get into your Google account, they can, in the upper right-hand corner, when you see the three little dots, if you click on that, it will show you that this is the keys to your kingdom. It will show you that they are saving your passwords, all of your payment information. So we have to think our Google password has to be extremely strong and different than any other password, because if somebody can get in there, chances are they're gonna see what the other passwords are to some of the other accounts, and they're gonna see what your payment information is. So we do need to take our Google account password seriously. Okay, well, I think we're about time. Um, okay. Just a, a bit uh, talking more about your podcast that's coming up, yeah? Um, you've got really interesting people, you, you say, that are coming up, right? Yes, I'm very excited. So it's, uh, I, I, I believe in storytelling, and I think by people being able to tell their stories related to scammers and identity thieves, I think that's going to be very good. So I have some, some bad hackers turned good, so now ethical hackers. I have uh, FBI agents, ex-CIA agents, uh, romance scam uh, victims, unfortunately, of over almost a million dollars. Um, identity theft victims. So it's going to be it's going to be a good good podcast for everybody to kind of learn a little bit about how they can better protect themselves, their families, and their businesses. Well, I'm looking forward to to seeing some of that. Um, and uh, thank you for thank you to you, obviously, for for, for speaking and for your presentation. And uh, everyone in the in the comments and who was watching live, thank you again. Um, and yeah, have a nice day. All right, take care. Okay, goodbye. Bye.